Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm call coming in from Seattle, Washington. So it's a little earlier um, on my end. So if my voice cracks a little bit, it's just because my voice hasn't been used um, yet. So uh, let's get right into it. Okay, so as uh, I was introduced, my name is AJ Musewe. I use she, her pronouns, and we are going to talk about the Black-centered origins of Juneteenth. So real quick, let me just introduce myself. Um, I am the Director of Interactive History at Common Power. We are a civic action-based organization out here in surprisingly sunny Seattle. I also co-host a podcast called Battle Fatigue with a good friend of mine where we talk about um, history that we weren't taught and also just what it means to be black and uh, represented in this country through media. I, I'm considered a historical scavenger hunter. I'm absolutely a full comic book nerd. I have the Batman and Star Wars tattoos um, to prove it. Um, essentially a historical scavenger hunter, I see myself as somebody who actively searches for narratives um, of black people that are not uh, generally told or taught to us in school or taught to us accurately in school. One of my biggest uh, goals as always is to amplify the voices of black women whenever I can. And in the uh, kind of uh, framework of black women besides my mother, Beyonce is my queen. All right, so let's get, in, let's get into it. Also, um, if folks have questions, please feel free to engage in the chat. Um, it will not uh, throw me off. So Dr. Harrington, if you do see a question in the chat um, and you wanna just kind of call out to me, that's perfectly fine. Um, this is kind of how we're going to move uh, through this. So first, we're going to take a look at a timeline to get us from secession to the Civil War. As much as I would love to dig into all of the dense history that happens around this time, we don't have um, enough time for us to go through that. So we're going to look at a timeline that's going to help orient us. The Emancipation Proclamation. In order for us to understand the Emancipation Proclamation, we do have to talk about Abraham Lincoln. He was complicated, he also was a colonizer, and we need to kind of dissect what that means. Because Black folks have always been active participants in their own liberation. So this idea that Abraham Lincoln was this great emancipator, we need to kind of contextualize that. After we get through that, um, we're gonna look at General Gordon Granger, um, him giving order number three, which got us to Juneteenth. And then we're gonna kind of end with the importance of access to information. Um, and then we are going to leave room for questions at the end if folks do not feel like asking questions during the presentation. Prior to us getting started, I will be using um, video clips and clips of podcasts to kind of break up the fact uh, that I don't wanna just be talking at you the whole time. This clip is from when ta Coates was doing his book tour for The Water Dancer. I want us to pay attention to the idea of language. For the black folks in the room, this is something that we absolutely um, live with. And also, I just want to reiterate it for the non-Black folks in the space. Um, Dr. Janae, give me a thumbs up if you can hear um, the audio. Slave sounds like something that the person is, as opposed to the condition which somebody else put upon them. Black people in this country from the period of 1619 to, to, uh, 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 to 1865 were not slaves. They were enslaved. The thing was done to them. And underneath of that was all of their humanity, all of their you know, identity, all the laughing, all the crying, all the mourning, all the singing, all the dancing. It was not, um, what was done to them was not their identity. So the reason I wanted to start with this is because we are going to be dealing with language that um, will use the term slave. As much as I, as I possibly can, I will be using the terms enslaved, I will be saying held in bondage and all of that because I wanna make sure that we understand that we are talking about full human beings who even in the face of bondage did their damnedest to live full lives and have families. So as we're going through this um, presentation, please try and keep that in mind. And also um, for those of you who are not using this terminology, I absolutely challenge you to start shifting um, your vocabulary. So let's look at the timeline. <clears throat> Again, this is a very dense period of time we're talking about. So this timeline essentially is to help contextualize and to kind of table set um, what we're going to be talking about. September 1858. Okay, so at this time, Lincoln was engaging in presidential debates with a man named Stephen Douglas. During that time, Lincoln did say this, 
I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the black and white races. What is important for us to note is at this time, Lincoln is trying to appeal to the anti-slavery folks in the North, and he's also trying to appeal to the pro-slavery folks in the South. Now, I will say this, just because you're an abolitionist does not mean that you are pro-Black. There are definitely instances of abolitionists not even willing to walk with Black folks in the North. So Lincoln had to try and figure out what was his moral um, compass and how does he appeal to a country that's already starting to split. November of that same year, Jefferson Davis gives a speech to the uh, Mississippi legislature where he says, it seems now to be probable that the abolitionists and their allies will have control over the next House of Representatives. Basically what he's saying is, A, just wanna let y'all know, if you guys elect this dude, we're out. November of 1860, Lincoln is elected president without a uh, Southern electoral votes. Almost 10 states did not actually have him on the ballot thinking that they were going to prevent him from becoming president. The electoral college basically said, nah bro, this ain't it. In December of 1860, South Carolina secedes first followed by Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. All this happens prior to Lincoln being inaugurated as president. 1861, on the orders of Jefferson Davis, who's the first president of the Confederacy, the Civil War starts with the first shot at Fort Sumter on April 12th. A year later, Abraham Lincoln is freaking out. He's like, oh my God, we're in the middle of the Civil War. I don't really know what to do. And so he decides that before he essentially executes the Emancipation Proclamation, he's going to have a conversation with the deputation of free Negroes. We're going to get into that a little bit later. In January 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation officially goes into effect. We'll also go into what that actually meant. And in the spirit of advocating and amplifying Black voices, there was a raid that was on the Coombe River that was led by one of the most famous uh, conductors of the Underground Railroad. And we're gonna talk about what that looked like, along with other stories of Black people being advocates for themselves. April of 1865, a lot of things happened. The Civil War ends in April on April 9th with the surrender of the Confederacy to General Ulysses S. Grant. Lincoln is also shot in the back of the head by John Wilkes Booth at Fort Theater on April 14th, and he dies around 7 a.m. the next day, April 15th, which means Andrew Johnson then becomes president. Andrew Johnson was horrible. We then get to June 19th, 1865, General Granger reads order number three in Galveston, Texas, and we officially get Juneteenth the end of the Civil War, and also in December, we get the passing of the 13th Amendment, which officially lawfully frees enslaved Black people. So that was a lot. We're going to kind of stick to the 1862 to 1865 range. And again, as folks have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. So let's talk about the myth real quick, because in order for this Civil War to actually be a thing, the Civil War, um, this Confederacy needed to be fighting about something. So the Confederacy, um, basically was around the myth of the lost cause, right? One of the biggest myths that was pretty hidden um, in certain instances, and right now, if you're talking about the myth of the lost cause, this is not one of the things that folks talk about, but essentially it was that slavery was good for black people, right? The myth of the lost cause had multiple tenants. One of the tenants did say that uh, the North with Northern aggression was the cause of the civil war, but a lot of it in actuality, as we know, was the civil war was about slavery. Um, it essentially perpetuated this idea that Black folks were saved from this savage and barbaric life in Africa and brought to civilized living. The History of Virginia by Mary Tucker McGill um, said, generally speaking, the Negroes proved a harmless and affectionate race, easily governed and happy in their condition. Obviously, that's not true. It also said that profit was a natural order of things and that white masters were benevolent and kind, specifically General Robert E. Lee. That also was not true. So with that understanding, let's talk about Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln was complicated. Now I had very, very, and still do have very, very strong feelings about Abraham Lincoln, but also I can understand, I have to be able to look at him within the context of the time that he lived, right? And that makes things really, really complicated. He was pre prejudiced as were many men of his time. We need to be very clear that Lincoln was not an abolitionist, not, nor was he pro-Black for quite some time. And he actually was very much so pro-colonization. Now this brings us to the deputation of uh, freed Black men, right? On April 14, on August 14th, excuse me, 
1862, Lincoln is trying to figure out what to do. He already has a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation. His cabinet basically was like, yo, hold up. We need a big union victory before we start, you know, doling out proclamation. And so Lincoln had one more thing up his sleeve that he wanted to try out. Led by a man named Reverend Edward Thomas, these black men were invited to the White House and they're thinking like, yo, Lincoln is gonna talk to us about the plight of black people. We're gonna figure out how to free our people. Lincoln basically was like, nah, that's not it. He filibusters at them. He talks at them the entire time and essentially lays out what he thinks. He's like, the Civil War is literally because of y'all. We wouldn't be in this situation if it wasn't because of y'all. And he says this to them, whether it is right or wrong, I need not discuss. But this physical difference is a great disadvantage to both of us, as I think your race suffer greatly, many of them by living among us while ours suffer from your presence. Okay. In a word, we suffer on each side. If this, is at least admi if this is admitted, it affords a reason at least as to why we should be separated. And what does he mean? Essentially what he wanted this deputation of Negroes to do was to convince other black folks, both free and enslaved, that the best thing for them is that if Lincoln was to emancipate and free them, he would then move ship all black people to a colony, which he was gonna call Lincolnia, that was gonna be around the area that present day Panama is today. And so what he wanted is for these black men to go back and basically rally the black community around this plan with Lincoln not necessarily doing any of the work because he needed to figure out something, he needed to figure out what to do with a black problem. Those black men looked at him and was like, yeah, all right, cool. And they left. So Lincoln realizing that, okay, I don't necessarily know if this plan is gonna work. Lincoln then um, is talking to his cabinet and they decide, okay, so we need to drop this, uh, this proclamation. And so in September, the proclamation basically is finalized and they're saying, before you announce this thing, like let's wait for a big union victory. The Battle of Antietam was, mm, some historians basically said it was a draw, but the union considered it a victory. And so the Emancipation Proclamation was announced um, and it officially went into effect on January 1st, 1863. Now these four states, Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, and Missouri are border states. It's really important for us to understand why the proclamation was complicated. And so we're gonna catch this clip um, where Todd Brewster, author of Lincoln's Gamble is explaining the complexity of the proclamation. And one thing I want us to keep in mind is that Abraham Lincoln was a lawyer prior to him becoming a politician. And so there's like all this jargon and tactics that he uses um, that lean more from his days as a lawyer. One of the reasons that the Emancipation Proclamation was so difficult to write is that it contained many paradoxes, ironies, and contradictions. Lincoln was freeing the slaves in the states in the rebellious South, states over which he at that point had no control. He was not freeing slaves in the North, in the border states, where, he, where, where slavery could continue despite the Emancipation Proclamation. Furthermore, he could not free slaves constitutionally. Uh, according to the Constitution, the slaves were, were property, were personal property. He landed on a justification that was to use the Emancipation Proclamation as an act of war. To him, this was justification to free the slaves and thereby undermine the war effort in the South. But this created a paradox. The Emancipation Proclamation did not carry the uh, force of law. It only carried a direction of policy conducted by his generals and his armies as they moved throughout the South. So theoretically, the slaves could have been re-enslaved once the war was over. Of course, with the constitutional amendment passed in 1865 to end slavery, that question became moot. Okay, so, one thing that we need to uh, make, make as clear as possible when we're thinking about the Emancipation Proclamation, the way I know I was taught in school was like, oh, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He read it out loud on January 1st, 1863 and enslaved folks went free, but that is not what happened. Within the bounds of the proclamation, essentially what it said is if you lived or were held in bondage in a Confederate uh, controlled area that was actively engaging or a slaveholding state, that was actively engaging in battle against the Union, then you could get yourself, if you could get yourself from that Confederate controlled area or that slaveholding state into 
the um, arms or into the boundaries of a union controlled area, then you were considered free. But the Emancipation Proclamation did not, uh, was not in effect in Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, or Missouri, because those were not states that were actively engaging in battle against the union. They were still part of the union. So you're talking about all the black folks who were held in bondage in these states, the proclamation actually did not affect them. They were not able to free themselves within the bounds of the proclamation. And so this idea that uh, Lincoln did this really big thing for black folks, it's like, mm, yeah, all right, maybe. One thing that did come out of the proclamation is that black folks were then a black men, able-bodied black men were then able to um, join the military. And we'll get into what that looks like in a little bit. But what we did do need to understand is black folks had not been waiting for some announcement by Lincoln in order to try and free themselves. So this portion, um, we're gonna talk about some um, direct stories and the firsthand accounts of what it meant to free yourself um, within the days uh, and the bounds of bondage. So let's talk about black self-liberation. Um, this is a quote from Erica Armstrong Dunbar, who's a historian that was featured in The Abolitionist on PBS. I highly recommend that documentary if you're able to catch it. Um, she says, there is a perception that good old Lincoln and a few others gave freedom to black people. The real story is that black people wrestled their freedom away. Now, one of the first stories I wanna start off with is the story of a woman named Una Judd. Um, there's been different ways to pronounce her name and because Una Judd is absolutely not alive right now to be able to tell us how to pronounce her name. Sometimes she went by Uni or Ani, um, just depending on the person who's pronouncing her name. She was held in bondage by the family of George Washington, specifically Martha Washington, George Washington's wife. Um, George Washington, obviously being the first president of the United States, he would have to travel between Philadelphia, um, between Pennsylvania, New York, and um, his uh, state in Mount Vernon, Virginia. In 1780, I believe, Pennsylvania passed what was called the Gradual Emancipation Law. And essentially what that said is if you've been in the state as a person held in bondage for X amount of, X amount of months, generally about six months, then after that six months of being in the state, you were free, so gradual emancipation. George Washington knew this law. Right, he knew this law, and so what he did is him and his secretary devised a plan to dupe both the public and also to dupe the uh, folks who were held in bondage. And he would rotate the folks that he would bring with him that were held in bondage, so that they would never reach that six month mark, so that he can continuously keep them in bondage. In 1793, the kind of first Fugitive Slave Act was passed. There was a Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution. But this now was the Fugitive Slave Act um, law that was passed in 1793. And essentially what that law said was that if you are an enslaved person and you escape, the people who held you in bondage are legally entitled to go and hunt you down, even if you go into a free state that does not recognize slavery. So in 1796, Una Judge finds out that Martha Washington is going to basically gift her to her granddaughter, Eliza Custis, um, uh, for her birthday. Now, Eliza was known as being batshit crazy. She was super temperamental. Um, she was violent. She was just really difficult and nobody necessarily wanted to be held in bondage by her, let alone anybody else. And so Una came up with a plan. So while the family was in Pennsylvania and they were getting ready to go back to Mount Vernon, Una dips, she, she runs away. And for the next several years, George Washington employed all of his power, which as the president of the United States um, was a lot to try and find this black woman. He put out advertisements, he sent his nephew to go after her. At one point he sent, um, he said the member of Congress to go after and he sat down with Una Judge and basically was like, yeah, George and them want you back. And she was like, cool, free me when I get back or tell me that um, I will receive my freedom after X amount of years and I'll go back. Homeboy went back to George and he was like, yeah, these are her terms. And he was like, how dare her, how dare she even have terms? And Una spent the majority of the time that George Washington was still alive, um, essentially running away. During the time that she was on the run, she was able to find, um, find love, marry, and have children. Even though she was consistently looking behind um, over her shoulder, 
she was able to live um, as full of a life as her circumstance allowed her. And this is what I mean. Black people, even during the days of enslavement, during um, in the face of some of the most harshest conditions that a human being could go through, always found a way to find little pockets of joy and to create family and community. So with that introduction, um, we're going to look at three separate stories. And part of the reason I wanted to start off with Una Judd is because that is way before the Emancipation Proclamation, that is way before Abraham Lincoln even was a politician. This idea that enslaved folks were waiting for, um, you know, the proclamation to go into effect is not true. There were slave revolts all the time. Um, Black people actively were trying to figure out ways to free themselves. So this clip is from a podcast called Seizing Freedom. It's one of my favorites. And Seizing Freedom is hosted by Dr. Kidada Williams. This clip is about a man named William Kennedy. And what we're going to hear is the length that William Kennedy went to uh, both uh, secure his freedom and also secure the freedom of his family. This is what William Kennedy, who was enslaved outside of New Bern, North Carolina did. In 1857, he had jumped from a moving train to escape being sold to Alabama away from his family. When the train had passed Goldsboro, it was night. Knowing that I was then as near to the residence of my wife and children as I ever probably should be, I made an excuse to look out of the door. And watching my chance, while the train was in full motion, passing through a wood, I jumped off. William hid in the woods near his wife's house, about five miles from his old plantation. I dared not permit myself to be seen by a white man for months, and then only by one or two of the very poorest who traded with me in small things. In 1862, after five years of hiding in the woods, William was thrilled to find the Union sweeping into New Bern to oust the Confederates. he emerged and found both refuge and work with the Union Army. Shortly after, he implored the camp superintendent of the poor to give him a free pass to retrieve his family and bring them to the camp. I have worked a month for you on the fort. Have eight dollars, wages received there, in my pocket. And now hearing that my wife's owner has run away and she and the children are up in the country alone, I have come to you for a pass to go and bring them down. It was a risky proposition. William had just spent the last five years desperately trying to avoid contact with white rebels who would undoubtedly re-enslave or kill him. Now he wanted permission to infiltrate their recently conquered territory. The army struck a deal with William. He could get a pass to travel home if he agreed to spy on nearby rebel encampments along the way. His wife and kids were welcome to come if he could get them. William agreed. He was given three days of rations, a pocket full of silver, and a free pass. He succeeded, returning with his wife, his children, and what the superintendent called valuable information. Okay, so I highly recommend Seizing Freedom. Um, Dr. Williams essentially finds firsthand accounts um, of uh, through letters, journals, newspapers, whatever she can find, um, and essentially creates this narrative that gives the voice um, uh, to black and brown folks first. We do not know what happened to William Kennedy's family after this moment because the uh, narratives of enslaved folks were not often uh, important enough to be documented. Okay, this is my other favorite uh, podcast. It's called Uncivil. It's hosted by journalists uh, Chinjirai Kuminika and Jack Hitt. Um, part of the reason I really love this podcast is because they dig deep into a bunch of stuff in history that we were never taught, or at least I was never taught, and it's been really um, eye-opening. So we're going to talk about the Kumbi River Raid. 
there are three major players in the Kumbi River Raid that we are going to uh, kind of break down. First is uh, Union Major General David Hunter. Um, he's important because of his relationship to the spy spy. Then we have James Montgomery. James Montgomery um, was a Jayhawker. I'll explain what that is in a second. And then we are going to listen to the clip that's gonna to explain to us who the spy spy was. Um, hopefully you know who that is <laughs> right now. Um, so uh, what's happening is in Port Royal, South Carolina, the Confederates are you know, really kind of winning essentially. And uh, Major General uh, Hunter is trying to figure out like, how do I break this up? How do I get the Union some momentum? And so um, Harriet Tubman was already in the area doing work for other, um, for the Union, kind of being a nurse, you know, kind of doing her whole uh, Harriet Tubman spy thing. So one of the important things about the relationship between Harriet Tubman and uh, Major General Hunter is that he supported her so fully that he gave her a military pass that, and essentially what that meant was that if she wanted to get provisions, rest, whatever, she could literally take that military pass to any Union camp and be able to get what she needs as she was doing her Harriet Tubman thing. James Montgomery um, is probably similar to uh, John Brown. Um, John Brown led the raid, uh, the failed raid on Harper's Ferry. The reason I brought up him being a Jayhawker is because James Montgomery, James Montgomery lived in uh, Kentucky, um, <laughs> or he lived in Kansas. And so one of the things that he did was he would, uh, he would fight pro-slavery settlers that would come into his town. Now the pro-slavery settlers would, uh, it was really difficult for black folks in these border states to know who actually was down for you. If you ran into a white person, you didn't know if that white person was pro-slavery, you didn't know if that white person was anti-slavery. James Montgomery was 100% anti-slavery and he was for the equality of black people. And so what he would do is he would sabotage the homes, the tools, um, whatever he could find, businesses of pro-slavery settlers. One day they retaliated. And when they retaliated, um, James Montgomery figured out who they were. He hunted them down to the town that they lived in and he burned the entire town down. So these are the folks who are kind of the major players of the Kumbi River Raid. So let's understand um, what the plan actually was. That Harriet Tubman, the conductor of the Underground Railroad, the government assigned her to Port Royal to work as a nurse and teacher, but she quickly took on a new role as well. Escaping slaves were debriefed by Harriet Tubman, so they would have had some intelligence, and, and that's where Harriet Tubman kind of shines. That's Jeff Gregg. He runs a boat motor repair shop near Port Royal and spends many of his weekends researching this expedition. He wrote a book about it. It's the only book exclusively dedicated to Montgomery and Tubman's plan. What they came up with was audacious, bordering on reckless. They would take boats up a nearby river, deep into heavily fortified Confederate territory, and raid eight separate plantations. They would recruit all the black people enslaved along the shore, and somehow make it out alive. How would they pull it off? Harriet Tubman could help. The banks of these rivers were usually lined with cannons, but the Confederates had pulled them from several of these rivers. One of them was the Cumby. Only a few riflemen remained. And while the river was filled with explosive mines, the men who laid them had escaped and told Tubman exactly where they were. She is not so much the, the scout or the spy. She's the one who took the information, gathered it, put it together, disseminated it to the proper people, which made this raid possible. I think that's what the CIA would call a spy master, right? I liken to is that she was not the James Bond, she was M. Who is more important? A James Bond, although a good figure for the movie, was expendable. M was not expendable. Okay, um, that's probably one of my most favorite descriptions of Harriet Tubman ever. So the plan, essentially the role that James Montgomery had was to train up a regiment of soldiers. Now, as the clip uh, mentioned to us, you have all these men who have escaped from plantations around Port Royal and have come to this Union camp, um, same way that uh, William Kennedy did when he found himself at a Union camp. Now, you're talking about men who probably may not have ever had access to a gun, um, probably only ever used agricultural tools, 
and also never had clothes that fit, right? And so under this uh, under this plan, essentially what they were trained to be was they became the, the second South Carolina Regiment of African descent under the training of James Montgomery. Now, James Montgomery absolutely was wild. I highly recommend you Google a picture of this man because he literally looked like um, one of the people from the Wild Thornberry's cartoon. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. It's a safe space here. I highly recommend you looking up an image of James Montgomery. Homeboy was wild. He looks like he stuck his finger in an electric socket, which wasn't around back then every single day. So he basically had a few months to train these black men who at this point are, you know, like deep in their feelings because this is the first time you received shoes that fit. This is the first time you received pants that weren't torn and tattered. You were receiving training and the plan was for you to go and liberate plantations where most likely your family was being held. And so I don't know what's more motivating than that. Like I just escaped, my, left my family, my wife, my kids, my, my sister, my mom, whomever, and now I'm getting training by a person who absolutely believes the value of my life. And with that training, I'm going to be able to go and free the very people that I love, the very people that I was separated from. So after a couple months of training, um, on the evening of June 1st, 1863, and part of the reason this is one of my favorite stories is because June 1st is my birthday. Um, so on the evening of June 1st, 1863, on three separate gunboats, they head off, including Harriet Tubman. They head off the river and the raid is gonna start. And in the morning of June 2nd, they dock at their first plantation and all hell breaks loose. So imagine you're a plantation owner, you get up, you're kind of surveying, you know, whatever, surveying the land, and you see these like black men in full union uniform marching up towards you. You absolutely should freak out. And so a bunch of um, plantations were burnt down. But one of the things that was very important in the plan that Harriet Tubman laid out is that do not burn down the quarters of the enslaved folks, because there may be some who decide to flee with the regiment and there may be some who stay for whatever reasons. And she wanted to make sure that they had a place to stay. Now you could destroy all of the uh, stock uh, houses, you could destroy all of the barns, you could destroy the plantation house, but whatever you do, do not touch um, the locations of the enslaved quarters. And also please make sure you do not burn anything that is going to be able to provide food um, and clothing for them. So. They, the raid happens, they burn down about eight plantations. And as they're coming back, heading to Port Royal, heading to, um, to base camp, um, the Confederates obviously had heard what happens and they line up. Before the Confederates are able to fire a single shot, James Montgomery orders his regiment to fire and not a single man flinched. They fire, they get past the Confederates. And at, by the end of the raid, um, conservative numbers say that Harriet Tubman was able to free 70 people by herself solo over the course of about 10 to 12 years. By the end of this raid on a single night, conservative numbers say that they were able to free 700 to 800 people. Um, and all of those able-bodied men who were able to then immediately turned around and joined the regiment um, of uh, the South Carolina 2nd Regiment of African descent. Absolutely one of my favorite stories. So I got, <laughs> I got one more story for y'all. Um, this is, uh, I, I love this story for multiple reasons, but um, this story is um, about a union spy ring that was led by a white woman named Elizabeth Van Lee and one of the greatest spies we have never heard of, a woman named Mary Bowser. The crazy thing about this, uh, this story is um, Elizabeth Van Lee, so let's start at the top. Elizabeth Van Lee was born into the Van Lee family, a very affluent family in Richmond at the time. And when her father dies, he leaves her the estate. So about 1848, he leaves her um, in control of the estate, which isn't always common. Um, sometimes it happens, but most of the times the estates are left to men. And when that happens, her and her mother are actually secret abolitionists. When that happens, um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Van Loo essentially frees all the enslaved folks. Now, one of the people that was held in bondage by the Van Loo family was this Black woman named Mary Bowser. Mary Bowser was absolutely incredibly intelligent. And so with the freeing of Mary Bowser, Elizabeth Van Lue decides, you know what, I'm going to invest in this young girl. And she sends her up to the north around Philly to go learn how to read and write. And while she's learning how to read and write, they discovered that Mary Bowser had an eidetic memory. She literally could remember everything that she ever came into contact with. And so Elizabeth Van Lue's like, dope, great, you're hella smart, this is awesome. And so she's like, I'm going to keep investing in this person. So Mary, uh, Mary Bowser decides, I want to go to Liberia and do um, missionary work. Elizabeth Van Lue's like, bet, I got you. She pays for her to go to Liberia, 
funds her time in Liberia. And after a few years, Mary's like, nah, this is not the life for me. I don't want to do this anymore. Elizabeth is like, all right, bet, girl, come on back. She pays for her to come back. And eventually, Mary Bowser um, works in the house of Elizabeth Van Lee, but works as a servant and is paid. Mary Bowser also meets a man named um, William and eventually gets married. And so William and Mary are working in the Van Lue household as servants. But again, because Elizabeth Van Lue does not believe in uh, bondage, forced labor, they are getting paid. One important thing to note about Elizabeth Van Lue is she was already um, part of the Richmond spy ring. And so she was working um, as often as she could to send information to Union generals um, and to Ulysses S. Grant. So Ulysses S. Grant knew who she was. A lot of the information that helped uh, turn major moments within um, the Civil War came out of Richmond. So one day, Elizabeth is chilling. She's reading the newspaper. She sees an ad. The ad is from Verena Davis, the first lady of the Confederacy. And basically, she's like, I'm looking for a housemaid. Elizabeth and Mary kind of look at each other and they're like, all right, bet we got a plan. So Elizabeth goes over to Verena Davis's house. They have tea, they catch up, whatever. And Elizabeth's like, yeah, girl, I saw your uh, ad. Um, and it looks like you're looking for, you know, you're looking for some help. Well, I got a girl, she, you know, she's not the smartest, she's not the brightest, but she knows what she's supposed to do. Verena Davis is like, yeah, girl, send her over. I'll test her out. We see how it goes. So Elizabeth Van Lue goes back to Mary and is like, Mary, they bought it. You, after living the majority of your life in essentially free, you have to now go back into the bowels of bondage and you have to do so in the White House Confederacy. So Mary essentially steals herself like many black women have to do and she goes into the house of the Confederacy. She goes into um, the, essentially she goes into the, under the chains of Verena Davis and let's hear a clip of what that may have been like for her. And how was Mary so good? Well, it was partly her incredible memory, partly her courage, and partly Davis's own assumptions about what Mary was capable of. It likely never occurred to him that a black woman was intelligent enough to be a spy. She was almost invisible in a way, you know, in that regard. How could a woman possibly do these brilliant things and pull this off, you know, that that disguised her for a long time. This was a weakness of the Confederacy, one of those hidden places in which wars are actually fought and won. Jefferson Davis couldn't see Mary for what she was, but Mary saw everything. She saw through the public image and authority of Confederate leaders to their real motivations, their habits, and their blind spots. Like many oppressed people, she saw how they saw her and played the role to a T, quietly fading into the background as she set fire to their plans. So um, essentially, uh, Jefferson Davis starts to get suspicious. He's like, something's going on. Basically, he has a hold. The call is coming from this inside the house moment. And eventually, one of the bakers who was part of the spy ring was discovered as a spy, and soon the connection between that baker and Mary Bowser was made, and Elizabeth Van Lue and the rest of the spy ring came up with a plan and pulled Mary out. Now, because we, we do not have enough documents to be able to uh, tell definitively exactly what happened, because after the end of the Civil War, a lot of the documents that were held um, in official capacity by the administration um, later on of Ulysses S. Grant were destroyed for the sake of the safety of these two women. In this uh, podcast, they do talk to the descendants of both Elizabeth Van Lu and Mary Bowser. And from the descendant of Mary Bowser, we learned that she went, she moved to Georgia and she started a school where in the daytime she would teach children of formerly enslaved, or children who were formerly enslaved themselves. And in the evening, she would teach adults who wanted to learn how to read and write. Um, eventually, Elizabeth Van Lu um, was made postmistress general by President Ulysses S. Grant. She was the first woman to have that position. And later on, the city of Richmond kind of turned on her because it came out that she was a union spy. And in order for her to be buried in relative peace, um, her uh, gravesite, uh, there's a big old boulder that was placed on there by the great by the grandson of Paul Revere, whose name was also Paul Revere. And that's out um, at a cemetery out in y'all's neck of the woods. Okay, so let's now start to wind down um, the presentation and let's talk about Galveston, Texas um, and how we got to Juneteenth. So part of the reason I wanted to kind of give that um, 
all of that context is because the reason that Galveston is so um, incredible is because one of how remote Galveston was and also what happened when um, order number three was, uh, was read. So Texas was somewhat a haven for enslavers. There were incentives. Um, because Texas, there weren't, there weren't a lot of like major civil war battles that took place in Texas when um, other parts of the Confederacy were being decimated by Union troops, um, and slavers would then move those held in bondage into these kind of remote parts of Texas. There were also interesting incentives that were placed forward for enslavers to move to Texas, one of them being that you would receive almost 80 acres of land for each enslaved person that you brought into Texas. So the Civil War ends in April. The Emancipation Proclamation, mind you, had been um, enacted in 1863. So now we're in 1865, two years later. Um, Union General uh, Gordon Granger, you know, he brings his, uh, he goes into Texas, into Galveston with 2,000 troops. And essentially he's like, so y'all didn't, y'all didn't know the, the, the thing? Okay, cool. So one of, out of the five orders that he had, the third one was for him to basically tell the Black people there that they were free. And so he reads out, um, General Order Number Three, and it says the people of Texas are informed that, in accordance with the proclamation from the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection here heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at the military post and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere by order of Major General Granger. Now, the interesting thing is the freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present home and work for wages. Yeah, that definitely did not happen. As soon as this order was read, almost 250,000 people, Black people, immediately took off and started looking for family members that were sold away. A lot of them did that through the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, one of the things that I do in my downtime, which isn't actually downtime, um, is I go into the Smithsonian Transcription Center on the website. There you can basically sort out and look at documents that were collected by the Freedmen's Bureau and help transcribe them so that they're easier to read. And through that process, I've been able to read a lot of firsthand accounts of letters that folks have gotten, um, Black folks who do know how to read and write. So a lot of times it was usually um, clergymen to write out letters that are then posted into newspapers of them looking for their family members. And so one of the major things that is uh, celebrated about Juneteenth is the immediate opportunity for Black, for Black people to be able to go start and reuniting with their family members. And so this, reading of um, the order number three essentially gave us Juneteenth. So as I'm able to, um, I was able to find some uh, a firsthand account of a woman who was in Galveston, Texas um, when the order was read. And so I, this is about a minute long and I want us to listen to the story of, uh, of Laura Smalley. Today is Juneteenth the holiday that marks what happened in Texas on June 19, 1865. Slave owners in the state had kept news of the Emancipation Proclamation issued two years earlier from their slaves. And on this day, 150 years ago, Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas, with 2,000 troops and a message, slaves were free. Laura Smalley, born into slavery in Texas, was a child when it happened. We didn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. Mom and them didn't know where to go. You see, after freedom broke, just turned, just like you turned something out, you know, didn't know where to go. They turned us out just like, you know, you turn out cattle, <laughs> I say. They didn't know where to go after freedom broke, she says, turned us out, just like you turn out cattle. Smalley recalled this in 1941 in Hempstead, Texas. She was interviewed by John Henry Falk. That interview now preserved at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. She told Falk that before June 19th, the slaves on the plantation she lived on didn't know slavery had been abolished after the Civil War. No, well, old Marshall didn't tell you no, it was free. He didn't tell you that? No, he didn't tell. They wait there and turn them loose on the 19th of June. That's why you know you celebrate that day, colors folks. Celebrate that day. Celebrate that day. So that is somebody who lived through Juneteenth. Um, and I want us to um, 
understand what happens when, so first and foremost, I'm not trying to put General Gordon Granger on a pedestal, but what he did was absolutely vital to the people in Galveston, Texas, and also just black people in general, having access to information um, for a piece of information that adversely affected their lives, right? Like you could have continued being enslaved or now that you understand that you're free and that it's actually a presidential order, then you were like, all right, bet, I'm about to go try and find my family. It completely shifts the way your life um, trajectory was. Now, this is a clip from a mini doc that Vice did um, where we're going to be uh, learning about May and Arthur Miller. Um, this documentary was following a lady named Antoinette Har uh, Harrell who was as considered uh, a slavery detective. This is what happens when information is prevented um, from reaching the people that it needs to reach. Antoinette's very first case was May Louise Miller, a woman who was held as a slave with her entire family in Mississippi until 1961. Though May passed away in 2014, Antoinette took us to see one of her brothers, Arthur Miller. May and Arthur being two of the older sisters and brothers, they remember a lot. It took a long time before Arthur really opened up and talked. We lived on, I don't know what would you call it, but something like a plantation to me. It belonged to several different white people. They all were family, I guess, and you couldn't leave. And if you did leave, they either come get you or or have somebody kill you, whatever, whatever. That's what, that, that's what happened. They did my mama bad. What'd they do to your mother? They just would have my mother, you know, the white men. You know, they, they, they just do what they want to do with her. And uh, I just wasn't big enough to do nothing. If I would have been, I don't know, probably wouldn't be. And this was in the 1950s or 40s? That was on through the 40s and the 50s all through the 50s and part of the 60s. So what would the repercussions be if you tried to leave or if you tried to refuse what they wanted? Back in them days, it's, 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 it was kind of like you had to do what the white man said or I'd get killed. My daddy's uncle, they made him dig a grave and kill him. <laughs> the they kill him and bury him in his own grave. Jerry Dawson, they killed him. He lived around the same place we lived at home. He left and say he wasn't coming back, they wouldn't get him, brought him back, carried him right down there from his house, killed him, hung him up in a tree. They hung him? They killed him first, casterized him, and hung him up right from his house where his children, everybody could see him. Were you aware that, this is 1940s, 1950s, that, <laughs> this is insane. Um, Arthur, this is this is this breaks my heart to hear this story. Um, growing up, did you, were you fully aware? This is in the 40s and 50s. You know, the civil rights movement is just about to begin. Were you aware of what was going on in the rest of the country at that time for Black people pursuing freedom? No. You know, you weren't aware at all that this was there was any pursuits for freedom in the 40s and 50s for us. No, not really. Not really cold. I think maybe like in 65, 66, then they was doing that marching. You know, that's when I really found out. The people are scared to talk about it. it, it it's people right now, y'all go to talk to you. It won't talk with y'all about this, you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're scared to do it. They got their fear in them, uh huh. How could something like this happen? A lot of these places, is that was in very isolated rural areas, it was easy. I mean, you had the opportunity to ride through some of these areas and you saw for miles and miles, there's absolutely nothing. So this is why um, Juneteenth is important. This is why what General Granger did was absolutely vital to shifting the lives of hundreds of thousands of black folks and also why Juneteenth is celebrated. Um, folks like Arthur, Arthur Miller and his family were literally held in bondage through um, the years in which my mother was alive. So this idea that we are so far from the days of enslavement is absolutely and completely a farce because we have people who were held in bondage that are the same ages 
some of y'all who are in this space or um, are were held in bondage during times where uh, you were very young. So let we have to actively participate in teaching um, the history of enslavement in a way that makes sense and also in a way that is accurate. So we don't try to remove ourselves from um, this history. So um, in closing, uh, let's look at what Juneteenth is today, right? So in 18, in 1979, excuse me, Representative Al Edwards um, out of Houston was the first legislature to introduce legislation, um, House Bill 1016 to the Senate, uh, to the state of Texas, officially recognizing Juneteenth as a holiday, which came through in um, 1980, right? And as of um, yesterday, the Senate and the House unanimously passed a resolution um, establishing Juneteenth as national, uh, establishing June 19th as Juneteenth National Independence Day. And it's like, yay, whoop, awesome. And also we still do not have an anti-lynching bill. We still do not have a way to hold people accountable who harm black and brown lives. So this idea that's like, yeah, cool, give us a national holiday, awesome. And also I bet you in a couple months or maybe even in a couple years, there's gonna be Juneteenth sales. At the end of the day, if you're going to make something a national holiday, it's really ironic that we're also making something a national holiday around the same time that people in, in the Congress are actively trying to keep folks from learning accurate history. There is a fight right now around critical race theory and teaching race in schools, and yet Juneteenth is a national holiday. So um, there's all, sometimes it feels like we have to have these really big major moments, but a lot of times it's the conversations that you also have at the dinner table. It's actively finding ways to uh, educate yourself and not always waiting for black and brown folks to be the ones to educate you. We all have the same access to the internet, right? Google is right there. Libraries are right there. If we are able to educate ourselves, then folks who participate in critical race theory are less likely to have so much power. As of June 10th, there are almost 20 states that are doing something within their state legislatures to try and ban critical race theory or even just teaching history. So imagine, how are they gonna teach about Juneteenth? What are you gonna teach about Juneteenth? How are you going to talk about why Juneteenth is a national holiday if we are not able to actively teach history um, accurately? But thank you for your time. Um, I really appreciate your attention and I'll stop share here. And if folks have questions, then um, we can do that. I don't know who's supposed to do the question. If you all have questions, um, you can, if you are comfortable, like you can come off mute or you can drop it in the chat. Dr. Harrington will um, be checking that out um, or feel free to raise your hand and we can go from there. Whew. Yes, Ms. Jones. Hello, everyone. Um, I just had a few comments. Just speaking on the Congress thing, I work on Capitol Hill. I'm on the House side, and I want everyone to know that since that bill passed, it sparked a lot of conversations in our offices as Black staffers, and it was very frustrating. So thank you for the presentation. Um, don't think we're stopping here. It was like a slap in the face to all the Black staffers who do the talking points, who write the bills, who do everything that you see go on the house floor and we had to just get a day off work, a day that we begged for. <laughs> so I just want everyone to know that this is not stopping. We are allied on the Hill as black people, as black staffers, POCs on the Hill. We are hearing everybody's concerns and we are putting pressure on all of our members. My boss is a white woman from New York. She has the richest um, congressional district in the United States. So a lot of the things we bring to her attention, she cannot understand or relate to, but I don't want you guys to think that that conversation stops there. Constant pressure. We are working so hard to get more done. And most of the people behind these bills and most people, people behind the changes in Congress are black staffers. We are young staffers. We are very progressive. So all of these older members, the talking points are coming from young black staffers like myself. So just know that this isn't stopping here. We are absolutely not taking this and thinking that we won because we didn't. This is only the beginning. Thanks everybody. Um, absolutely. Uh, I work for civic action organization and literally that's what we do. 
um, we will fly from Seattle and go to uh, go to DC and talk to the elected officials that we helped elect. Like, all right, bet. So we did all this door. We went and knocked on doors for you in 27 different states. Um, we advocated for you. We helped you pass bills. Now I need you to actually do it, right? There's a lot of um, black and brown folks who are down in the trenches, whether you are affiliated with an organization or you are a volunteer or you knock on doors or you work for some grassroots organization where you are doing so much work that is not recognized. And so what my organization does is we try and find folks like Taylor. We do try and advocate for them and also we have a lot of really affluent people in Seattle. If you're looking at um, kind of the trajectory of folks who are running for office, right? So the presidential um, elections, when we had like 17,000 candidates who were running for office, who were running for president, a lot of them would make pit stops in Seattle simply for fundraisers. They're not coming here to convince people. They're not coming here to be like, oh, we got to rally the black vote. No, what they're coming over here is to get money from the guy who runs Costco, is to get the person money from the person who runs, well, there's a pizza chain out here called Pagliacci. Y'all don't have that out there, but they're very rich out here. There, um, There's a lot of really affluent people, the Googles, the Amazons, the Microsofts, whatever. So they literally come out here to raise money. And so the people who participate in the education sessions that I put out are also the very same people who can drop $100,000 um, on a candidate, who can go to $50,000 dinners or whatever. So it's like, cool, take that energy where you've retired at 30 something and you get to live lavishly and go kick it on your yacht and let's go knock on doors in Chicago. Let's go knock on doors in Tennessee. Let's go knock on doors in Alabama. Let's go knock on doors in Louisiana because the dis disproportionate... Um, data that we get that's not always accurate that talks about who's actually disenfranchised part of that reason is because of people like y'all right you engage in a system that actively puts you on a pedestal you made a lot of money um and now let's put your money where your mouth is you want to move towards a just and inclusive democracy okay let's go support the people who are actively working towards a just and inclusive democracy so my job within the organization is to get people prepared to go travel i need you to understand why florida's voting patterns are like this i need you to understand why this area in alabama has really really low voter turnout rates from a historical standpoint oh because Bull Connor is out here acting a plum ass fool and didn't want people to vote. I need you to understand why it's cool. Yeah, let's talk about Rosa Parks and also let's talk about Claudette Colvin. Let's also talk about Joanne Robertson. Let's also talk about Diane Nash. So part of it is understanding the historical um, aspects of it. And that's why critical race theory is under attack right now because literally critical race theory is like, oh, racism is a thing. Let's talk about how that systemically and historically dis it puts people at a disadvantage. If we don't understand that, if we're always sitting here being like, well, no, like my family didn't own slaves. That's not the point. If you're white, you're white. At the end of the day, you do benefit from this, okay? And so when we have the opportunity to, as scary as it is, as like nerve wracking as it is, you actively have to push your foot forward. I'm not saying you put your foot back. Sometimes you do have to pause and take a breath. But at the end of the day, this history is not going anywhere. And the more people we have like Taylor, the more it's going to come out. So at some point, you just got to get comfortable with it. Get comfortable being uncomfortable, learn a bunch of shit, and then go do something. Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, what Taylor said, essentially. Do you guys want me to get to look at the chat? <laughs> I'm looking. <laughs> okay, so we have a question from Sean. How do we challenge the commodification and watering down of Juneteenth? We see how a lot of people in power will use gestures of symbolism over actual real material changes and I was just wondering, we've, we haven't seen capitalist entities co-op Black Lives Matter and pride while not giving back to Black communities. So um, hmm. how do we challenge the commodification and watering down of Juneteenth? Um, look, we live in a capitalist society, first and foremost. Um, so that that is that is a thing, right? And we are not close enough to... Um, disrupting that in a way that is going to be beneficial for poor black and brown folks, right? So within that capitalist society, I advocate that if you are going to participate in getting a Juneteenth t-shirt or whatever, at least, at the very, very least, go buy it from a black owned uh, business. This hoodie that I have on is by a black owned business. It's called the Influx with three eyes. Anytime that I am able to, I'm going to give money to black and brown people, 
at the end of the day. If you are a, a non-Black person, would I advocate? Again, there's all this idea that like, we need to start organizations or we need to go rally and march. Yes, we do need to do that also. It starts in these really small conversations that happen at your dinner table. If you're at dinner, Thanksgiving, whatever, Grandma Agnes says something real racist and you got kids at the table, it's looking at Grandma Agnes and be like, okay, I can't check her for whatever reason. I don't know what your family dynamics are. I can't check Grandma Agnes at the dinner table. But what I'm going to do is after dinner, I'm going to go talk to that kid and be like, look, Grandma Agnes is from a different time. In this house, we don't play that. So that the child understands that, oh, what grandma said is what grandma said, but mom and dad said this, or mom and mom said this, or my parents said this, right? So you start to correct that behavior. Then you get less racist kids who then go to school and then call that black kid the N-word because that black kid happens to be intelligent. Also, it's disrupting this idea that black and brown people can only be a certain thing, right? So if you are able to find black and brown doctors for your children, find black and brown dentists for your children, find, find books that actively paint black and brown people in good lights, right? It is, you have the same access to that. Make sure that representation of black people is as dynamic as it can be for your little white kids. So that as they grow up, this becomes something that is completely normalized and they don't say things like, huh, you're really articulate. Understand the racism in that sentence. Why shouldn't I be articulated? Also, even if I don't speak in a vernacular that is similar to yours, understand their historical context of why I don't speak in that vernacular and also understand that that does not mean that my, I'm any less intelligent. You have to start disrupting the ways that you look at Black people. And then this question of challenging the commodification of watering down of Juneteenth won't even be a thing because you'll already understand the importance of Juneteenth. So a lot of times it feels like it has to be these really big moments, but a lot of times it's actually these really small moments. And to the white women in the room, I need y'all to do more disrupting. At the end of the day, when you see a person of color who is in danger by a police officer or by any other entity, your white womanness can be the difference between this person staying alive or not. A lot of times it's literally you just saying, hey, are you okay? And then that person in the position of power sees you there and they're less likely to put that black person in, in harm's way. Because at the end of the day, this country has been built on protecting white women. So weaponize that at the end of the day and actually weaponize it for good rather than weaponizing it for the death of a black person. And then once we get into a system of doing that and granted it is mad uncomfortable, okay? It is absolutely uncomfortable. And also every single day that I walk out of my house, somebody reminds me that I'm black every single day for better or for worse. And most of the time, because I live in Seattle and Seattle is white as hell, it's for worse. And so every day that I walk out of my house is an act of resilience. It's an act of, it's a radical act. So I need you to be that radical because at the end of the day, if you're saying, I want this country to be better, I wanna do my part, it's these little moments and it's also these really big moments and I need you to engage in both. So Sean, I hope that answered, I hope that answered your question. Hi, yeah, it did. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Also, please listen to black women and queer folk. We have just been sitting around here waiting for y'all. We've been doing work. So whenever it's possible, please absolutely listen. Just tossing that out there. And then don't ask them to explain or repeat themselves. What I said is what I said. You understood it. You're intelligent. So do that more. <laughs> I don't have a single question. I just cannot contain myself. Like, I just want to brag on my friend. <laughs> like, <laughs> this was a great presentation. You did that. That's all up. You did that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> same, Tiana. Same, same. <laughs> what is there to say? <laughs> when will we be able to access the recording? <laughs> um, Honestly, probably Monday, realistically, so we have time to um, caption it and things like that. And then I can send it out. Since y'all had to register to attend, I have everybody's email address on the call. We can also share the resources that have been shared in the chat so that everyone will have them. And I do have a, um, a document of resources that includes both articles, um, documentaries, books, novels, and also um, books for children so that you can start having conversations about Juneteenth with the young people in your lives and also the young adults in your life. 
always, 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 if somebody tells you that they don't have resources, they're lying. Um, so I will send out um, the document of resources to Tiana or Dr. Harrington, and then y'all can um, send that uh, to folks as you see fit. Y'all, the space is available until 1.30, it's 1.06. Um, so feel free to hang out, ask questions, commune, but she cleared it. I mean, there's really nothing left to say. <laughs> she ate it up. So, I mean, y'all can stay here, hang out as long as you want to. I need a minute. <laughs> um, funnily enough, I will be coming to Richmond uh, not well, I will be coming to Richmond the next week, but also my job is going to be doing a learning tour to Richmond on um, in September. Um, again, because I deal with a lot of affluent white folks who are very far removed from um, the Confederacy and kind of like being, being in the middle of where history happened, we're going to be taking a seven day trip, which I'll be leading um, to Richmond, Virginia to go look at the Confederate monuments to also we're going to go to UVA to go look at the uh, Memorial of Enslaved People, um, which holds the eyes of Isabella Gibbons. Um, and we're also going to uh, uh, explore the American Civil War Museum. So basically, I'm just going to keep rocking uh, white lives as often as I can with history. And also at the end of the day, um, it is important for people to be able to uh, get this history and not to get it with such vitriol that it pushes them back. But you also need to understand that some folks are engaging with this history for the first time. And it seems like a lot. Just because this history happened in this country doesn't automatically mean that you as a white person are a bad person. What it does mean is you are part of a system that is actively uh, participated in the decimation of black lives. And so those two things, you have to figure out a way to come to terms with that. And please, 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 whatever you do, do not ask black people to help you with that. That is something that you need to get together with your white homies and y'all need to figure out how to do it because black people are literally trying to survive. And I know that that seems difficult, but if you do want to have conversations with black people, please do not show up to the potluck with just Tupperware. I need you to bring a side dish or something. So say something like, yo, I read this article, or I read this book, this is kind of what I think about it. Um, I would love to have a conversation with you if you have capacity. Start there, but don't just assume that black people are sitting here waiting for, uh, waiting for you to ask them a bunch of questions. And also black people are not a monolith. The way that we all engage with our blackness is dependent and dictated by who we are as people and how we see ourselves. So just because I see myself as a certain version of black and I engage with my blackness in a certain way, does that mean that Dr. Harrington does that in the same way does not mean that Tiana does that in the same way. Please, please, please understand that if you do not want to be painted with a broad brush, please do not paint black people with a broad brush as well. Engage with that person in the way that they engage with you and understand that you will be engaging with another black person in a completely different way. And that is okay. Just like you don't want me to engage with you in the same way that I had to engage with a racist woman a couple of days ago. If you don't want that same energy, please do not give that energy to me. And sometimes that can be difficult to hear, sit with it, process. I always urge people after these presentations to take a moment and kind of decompress and process the information how you will, but do not go talk to a black person about it. As difficult as that may be, please do not, because this is history that black people have in the back of their minds all the time, had to actively search for this history, had to do a lot of work on their own because it was actively held back from them. And so find a way to process for yourself. The resource list is an excellent way to start. Start a book club with your homies, do a wine and book situation. I don't know, whatever it is, just don't go to black people. It's just, I think that's all. Let me just, <laughs> just cut it off right there. So if people want to contact you, AJ, is the Common Power website the best way to do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can either send an email to hello at commonpower.org or my email is aj at commonpower.org. But all the events and stuff that I do are in there. Um, surprisingly, they gave me my own page. So it's under the education page. Um, and I am pretty much available for questions and all that. But yeah, we hold education events fairly often um, with myself. And also we're going to start doing in-person stuff um, and trips and all that stuff. So when we're in Richmond, who knows, maybe y'all can come meet up and uh, learn some things. But yeah, please reach out through the Common Power website. Perfect. Um, I have a question and I'm hoping sure. it's okay for me to ask you this because I've been wanting to ask someone, but I, like you said, I don't want to burden my black friends with this question. Um, All right, that's a slippery slope, but cool. Our town is having a Juneteenth parade. Okay. 
is it appropriate for white people to attend this? I don't want to inject myself into something that is not meant for me, but I want to expose my children to history that they aren't getting in school necessarily. Um, so I'm just curious if that's, that's the question, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one, I appreciate the question because it shows intent. It shows you uh, thinking a little more critically about what your presence means in a celebration of Juneteenth for Black people. So first and foremost, we'll start there. Second of all, it depends on how you want to engage and participate in that uh, that uh, parade. Now, if you feel like you want to be marching down the middle of the street, like, nah, don't do that. If you just want to go and like teach your kids and be like, hey, this is Juneteenth. Here's um, a book about it. Let's learn about it so that your kids are not just out here being like, oh, look, Black people. That is probably what I would recommend in events where you are going where you are not the primary uh, audience. Educate yourself first so that when you're entering into that space, you're entering that space with a certain level of reverence, um, especially because of what, well, I'm not sure. Are you in Rickon? No, I actually, I live in Northern Virginia and my daughter okay. attends a school where it's only 25% white kids. So she's, it's not like she goes to a school that's only white kids and it would be a unique experience. Yeah, um, understood. Also, <laughs> Yeah, also anywhere where there's white people is a unique experience for black people. So unless you are in a full black uh, community, engaging with white people is always gonna be something. So I commend you for sending your kid to a school that is majority black and also if there's white people in that space, harm can be caused. So I just want you to also keep that in mind. Um, as you can participate in that, um, you can go and attend. I also definitely recommend that you try and do as much research as you can. The resource list that will be sent out will include children's books. So whether you are able to um, read the books before or read the books after, I just recommend you exposing your children as often as possible. So be as respectful as you can um, in those spaces. It may mean that you don't get to be at the front of a lot of these uh, parades. It means that you don't get you know, prime seating at a lot of these parades. I definitely recommend you leaving a uh, space and room for people of that community. Whether it's a Juneteenth parade, whether you go to Carnival or whatever, you as a white person have to understand that your presence in that space may make some people uncomfortable at the end of the day. That's just something that you have to come to terms with, um, but also the intent in which you go into that space with. And if somebody approaches you and is like, yo, you know, I feel some kind of way about you being here. Sometimes you just got to take the L and be like, thank you for letting me know and then leave. The idea of like defending yourself, which I think sometimes is a natural response, can cause a situation to become more than it actually needs to be. So sometimes you just have to take the L and say, you know what, thank you for letting me know. I'm going to go find a different way to educate myself. So having flexibility and understanding the importance of the situation is probably going to be the best thing that you can do. But I do not think that you should not attend. I do think that going into it with a certain level of intention and also preparing your children is the best way for you to go about it at this point. Okay, great. Thank you for the feedback. I really appreciate it. Of course. I do have a question slash comment. I'm not sure if anybody else one had a question before me. So if you do feel free to go before me. Um, but I'm clearly in a space of a lot of elite black people and I did not grow up like that. No Jack and Jill's, none of those type of vibes. So it's kind of hard for me to be in those conversations with those people. And they have, they're one, they're one sided because they experienced a different life than I did. And I'm trying to, I guess, change my, my outlook on those kind of people um, and try to educate them as much as I can. But as another black person, I just feel like that's not my job, but I don't want to be that way because if I'm taking the time out to educate non-PLCs, which I know that's not my job, but I would love to educate them as much as possible because in an office of a hundred, it's only 10 black people. I'm around that a lot. And yes, I work for the, a democratic committee, but uh, again, a lot of people that I work with cannot relate to me. They do not experience what I experience. So yes, we might have those talking points or those we're writing these bills, but they can't fill it. And I had to learn that people are not going to understand what they don't go through. So my question to you is, do you see this a lot when you are traveling and dealing with different people who grew up differently? Um, and how do you interact with them? Or do you feel like it's your job to, um, to educate those POCs who grew up elite or had the private school experience. And there's nothing wrong with that. I am not shunning them at all whatsoever, but it is a certain tone that they use with me or uh, a certain level of thought process that they think that I have education wise or whatever the case is when they figure out that, oh, I did not participate in Jack and Jill or I, my father did not get me this internship and it became a job because of 
the congressman in my area. So how do you deal with those kind of people or how do you maneuver? Do you feel like it's our job to still educate them or just let them be? Um, first of all, let's thank you for your question. Second of all, what pronouns do you use? She, her. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, I engage with those people um, a lot. Uh, I think at the end of the day, um, it's about you choose, picking and choosing your battles. What do you have energy and time for? Um, what are the things that you're trying to accomplish and how do these folks play into that? Um, elitism is everywhere, right? Elitism is also within the black community. And that's why I wanted to reiterate like black people are not a monolith. So yes, there are some folks who grew up, um, I was having a conversation with Tiana and it's like the Bel Air blacks versus like the West Philly blacks, right? We saw through Fresh Prince, like what Will had to go through and trying to navigate Carlton and Uncle Phil and Aunt Viv, dark skin as Viv, um, and all that jazz, right? So, um, one of the things that I would recommend and one of the things that I do is I pick and choose my battles. If I got time and energy today, like bet, all right, Carlton, we gonna go at it. If I don't have time today, then like, nah, I'm good. I got other stuff that I need to handle. The most important thing, at least for me in this situation is do you feel safe and do you feel like you have the energy to engage? Um, there's gonna be some folks who absolutely do not want to listen because of the uh, what their family had to go through in order to get them into this position. Also, white supremacy is embedded everywhere. There's anti-Blackness within the Black community as well. And that is really difficult sometimes for us to understand, but it shows up in all these really diff difficult ways. So what I recommend for you is keep being a boss bitch at the end of the day. Let your work and your actions speak for yourself because no matter what, if they do not want to see you in a way that you see yourself, they're not going to no matter how much work and energy you put into it. If they're willing to have a conversation and you want to have resources and you have the ability and the time and the capacity to educate and be like, yo, I grew up this way, this is what I had access to, then cool, do it. Otherwise, don't. At the end of the day, as long as you have a community of people that look out for you, a community of people that sees you as who you are, community of people understand that the work that you are doing is so difficult, is so absolutely difficult because of the marathon, right? This is not even like a 26 mile marathon. This mess is 50 something miles the first go around, right? You have to conserve your energy for being on Capitol Hill. As somebody who has to go knock on doors and deal with legislatures and all of that, I can understand a little bit of how difficult your job is. So find time for what you have energy for and reserve your energy for what is most important to you because them folks are not gonna see you if they don't want to see you. And you banging your head against the wall is not gonna do anything for you. As already somebody who has to deal with politicians and dealing with the plight of black people and literally feeling like if people don't vote a certain way, Black folks are going to get shitted on. Like, you don't need to be spending your time trying to convince somebody of your own humanity that's within your community. Because that kind of hurt is a completely different kind of hurt. It's one thing for Agnes, Grandma Agnes, to call me some kind of way or to see me in some kind of way. But it's a whole nother thing for a Black person who understands what it's like, or at least understands a version of what it's like to be Black in this country, to view me in a way that they don't see my whole humanity. So that is what I would recommend. And that is how I kind of process and move through the world. I know I got facts behind everything that I say. So if you want to sit down and talk, bet, let's sit down and talk. If you don't, like, I'm good. I'm still going to be Black. Um, minding my business over here. I'm still going to attend sessions rocking a beanie and a hoodie. That does not dictate my intelligence. And so that is what I would recommend for you. Figure out what you have time, energy, and capacity for and put your energy towards that. And also show them who you are with your work. As long as your hustle speaks, they can't say anything. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. I don't even know what to say. I just... <laughs> Woo, we just, I'm gonna just mute myself. Everybody feel the same way I feel in this Zoom call. So thank you so much. Absolutely, absolutely. I did have a point <clears throat> from the question I believe Jessica had about like white folks going to Juneteenth and stuff. So like there's a theoretical framework called ontological expansiveness and it essentially means that yep. white people that they have access to and that they have right to each and every space ever created. Um, so like for example, white people feeling like, oh yeah, like I could go to HBCU, it's whatever. And just overlooking the fact that HBCUs were created because white people said we can go to school with them so like, again, just being aware that 
that we're, when you're in black spaces and you're occupying spaces, especially around like blackness or like black liberation, being mindful of the space that you take and also being mindful that again, like you may think that you own everything and you may think that you can be everywhere all the time, but it's not your space. You are a guest. It is not your house. So act accordingly and make sure that you're into the space with respect. And like AJ said, with reverence, because it's not for you and everything is not for y'all. And it's not to be like, nah, 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 boo -boo, you can't be here. But it's like, no, we can have our own things. Other people can have their own things. And that's just what it is. That's essentially what Tulsa was. A bunch of black people were being treated horribly. Tulsa um, OW girly was like, bet I'm gonna go create my own town. Created his own town, Tulsa became extremely successful. Money passed hands 13 times within Greenwood District before it moved out. White folks decide, decided like, I don't like this. I don't like successful black people, right? Economic threat, the idea that the pie is finite and the pie does not expand when more people get access to the pie. And then Tulsa was burned down. Not only was Tulsa burned down, then we don't even talk about Tulsa being burned down correctly until just a couple years ago, right? So yes, that is why I said, enter the space with reverence, research, uh, do get educated about whatever it is that you wanna participate in first so that you understand if I enter in this space, and that's why I also mentioned, if a black person comes up to you and is like, yo, I'm not really feeling you being in this space, just be like, all right, bet, I got you and remove yourself from the situation because that black person has every right to want the space to be theirs. Because like Tiana just mentioned, that idea, that expansion is like, I can go do whatever I want and stomp around through it, right? Well, how come I can't, how come I can't say the N word? Why do you want to? Let's ask you like, why, why is that a thing? Well, the rappers say it, and are you, a, are you a baby? Like, are you, are you make the stallion? Like, I don't understand. So there's gotta be this thing where white folks get comfortable with understanding that like, there is just something that you don't get to do and that's the end of it. And it is really uncomfortable because historically that has not been what the narrative has been. And so you have to actively, and that's why I'm saying, start with your kids. Because little black kids learn what racism is through action before we have the narrative and the definition of what it is. White kids learn about racism during Black History Month and are taught in a very uh, uh, structured way, right? My niece is six. My niece was six when she first had her first racist experience. So this little girl told her that she was the wrong color, that she couldn't play with her. Where did that little girl learn that language? She learned it from her parents. And so if we don't find small ways to correct that behavior, then I don't have to be sitting in a parent-teacher meeting looking at this family like, so we can go outside and fight or what? Because your daughter decided to be mean to my little niece. Right. And now Jordan's bubble of innocence is burst. Right. It's popped at six years old. And she's looking at herself like, damn. And that's when you start having kids trying to scrub the, the dirt off of themselves or harming themselves because somebody didn't correct their behavior because they didn't think it was a big deal. So at all times, and I know it seems like a lot of white folks at all times, you have to be aware about what your whiteness does to other people. The same way that if I'm walking around Trader Joe's and there's a white woman walking in front of me, I have to try and keep myself far enough back from her that she can see me at the corner of her eye because immediately she feels unsafe. My life is in danger. When all I'm trying to do is get to the spicy chili mangoes. I don't care about what's in your basket. I just want to get to the spicy chili mangoes. But because you are this close to me and you start to get tense and you start to feel unsafe, now my life is in danger. And I got to walk extra slow because Kathy wants to look at the applesauce, right? So pay attention. As much as I have to pay attention to enter how I have to engage with y'all to stay alive, I need that, I need that reciprocated. And it's really difficult because it's not something that you're going to be able to do every day, but it's something that you have to start practicing. I just literally, I just really wanted some chili spice mangoes. Like it was not that big of a deal. Just took so long to look at applesauce. Anyway. Wow. Um, questions? <laughs> Hi, Tiana. This is Ashley. Is it okay to speak? Yes. Hey, Miss Gaddy. Hi. I don't got no questions. I just, I just text you, but I'm gonna say it out loud. Who is this person you sat before us? You have blessed us. Yo, oh, I am filled. Your, your mind and knowledge is vast. The way in which you are delivering is this 
there is this um, calm power to you that is making your words and knowledge radiate bigger in me than if you had a megaphone. Mm -hmm. And um, I really have a pre, like, I am, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, especially coming from a black woman, that means a lot, thank you so much, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Donate to Common Power so more people can hear this. <laughs> Appreciate that, OG. Thank you. Do y'all have that link in the chat somewhere to do that? Um, can we get that that that, that it, donation information? I'll, I'll drop it again so it's fresh. Give me that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> okay well y'all this has been lovely i have to go lay down my body is hot um we are going to caption this um for like accessibility purposes we will get this out by monday um you can reach out to myself my email is ingram td at vcu.edu i'll drop it or you can reach out to dr harrington and we will get that information to y'all but thank y'all for being here today thank you for being in community with us um please get some water get grounded have a seat because feelings energy so thank y'all for being here definitely reach out if you have any questions we'll be sure to send out um AJ's resource list, contact information, all that stuff. Thank y'all so much for being here and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank y'all for being here. Bye. <laughs> Bye y'all. Thank you. <laughs>